Greetings, fellow scribes. Welcome back to the archive. This week, I conclude my series on the Pantheons of Scion 2nd Edition's core books with the Tuatha de Danann, the Gods of Ireland. While variations of them show up in Scotland, Wales, and even the mainland Celtic cultures, the ones that are most well known are the ones from Ireland. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as I talk about the children of the goddess Danu. One feature of the Tuatha is triple goddesses. Briad, the goddess of the forge, inspiration, and healing is three goddesses, but also one. One collective mantle between the three. And it's sort of a debate on, is she three separate individuals? Three sisters, one with three different incarnations, or any combination of them. And this is one of those aspects that that's sort of unique. I mean, while you know you have the Greeks with the fates, the Norse with the Norns, the three Norns, the three fates, they're they're still separate individuals. You might collectively ad appeal to them, but you're generally knowing that you're dealing with the one for the present or future, most likely not the past or the weaver of the thread. And yet when you deal with the Tuaha, you deal with these individuals, these three separate deities that are also one deity. It's not as cut and dry. You, know, you can talk about Bav, Bacha, and Nevin, who are the three aspects of the Morrigan. You've got the triple goddess Eryu, who's the goddess of sovereignty, who determines who gets the throne of the sacred hill of Terra. And this is one aspect you have to deal with, that there's going to be deities when you deal with the Tuatha that are not fitting into a nice, neat little box. An example they gave is four siblings who are all scions of Briad. One is a master smith. One is a I, you know, master healer. One is a great muse spreading inspiration. And then the fourth one has a bit of all three kind of stepping outside of those neat little boxes. But, again, that's kind of a core philosophical aspect. But there's other aspects to the Tuaha. For instance, there is a belief that the king should be whole. Now, in a battle with the ancient uh, Fomorians, Nuada, the king of the Tuaha, lost his hand and thus could not be king anymore. Dionkek, the God, the physician of the gods crafted a silver hand 
for Nuada, thus getting Nuada's most famous epithet, the Silver-Handed. But, of course, that still didn't solve the issue. That was still a artificial hand. Nuwata still was not whole. So, Dianke's son grew a new hand for Nuwata. Like, from, from the stump, grew a new hand. Thus, allowing Nuwata to resume being the king of the Tuaha. Dion Keck's reaction, like any good father, was to kill his son in a fit of professional jealousy. Yeah. That, that happened. Basically, the physician of the gods couldn't stand that his own son surpassed him in skill. And so he killed him. So, when you are dealing with the Tuaha, you are dealing with, like the Greeks, you are dealing with gods who are very much people. They have their goals, they have their aspirations, they have moods, they are not perfect entities. And that helps set them apart, but also grounds them with their people. I think it's a fitting bit because, well, when you look at the history of the Irish people before the invasion of the British, you're dealing with people who their ideal of warfare was essentially the cattle raid. They would raid neighboring neighboring groups for their cattle and their women. And this is a this is a pantheon that originates from people that that is their culture. And so that is where you're coming from. You're also dealing with a culture that believes that great heroes have limitations put on them. You know, the great hero Ku Cullen because he had accidentally killed the hound of a man called Cullen, is how he got his name, Ku Cullen, the Hound of Cullen. But at the same time, because of that, he had a geese put on him that he could not eat dog meat. Other things that would have Applied to him over the years were that he could not refuse hospitality. So, before his final battle, when he was traveling down the road, a an older woman offered him food and shelter. He could not refuse hospitality. Which meant he also could not refuse the food that was offered. Which was a broth made of dog meat. And so, when he went to his final battle, at a dramatically appropriate point, he lost his great strength and skill at arms. And then tied himself to a tree and continued fighting. Oh yeah, that's actually because he had... The, the reason for this is because he had rejected the advances of the Morrigan. 
because he was such a great warrior. And the Morrigan is really was really attracted to great warriors. But that is the core of the gods. That's how they interact. Very much like people. Now, the virtues of the Tuatha are, are the two sides of what's called Inek, which we would think of as face. The outward reputation of a individual. These two aspects are honor and prowess. The honorable scion is generous, extends hospitality, and keeps their word. Prowess is, of course, strength at arms. And you know, it's how good they are in a fight. And these two things ironically don't conflict with each other quite as much. Though sometimes you are going to use dirty tricks to win a fight, which would move you away from being honorable, but falls into prowess. And that that's the core, the driving principles for the Tuaha. Now, for the most part, they get along to, to greater or lesser extents with the different pantheons. They really don't deal much with the eastern pantheons or even the Netcher. They don't quite get along with the Theoi just because you know the Theoi connect to Britain because of the invasion of Rome into England but they treat the Aesir as long lost cousins however every pantheon has its own sort of greatest weakness for the Tuaha, their greatest weakness is also their greatest strength. You see, they gain power from their Gyasa, the oaths that they take, the obligations they undertake, the restrictions that they take. All of these grant them some measure of strength and power beyond what they would normally have. Basically, playing with the fates to get them things that they would not normally be able to do. However, all of these oaths, these obligations, these rules that they follow, these come with a price if they fail to follow them. And every scion Every god in the pantheon is bound by these gyasa, these geese, because these are their core power, the core of their strength. And so if you find the weaknesses, like Ku Cullen could not refuse hospitality and could not eat dog meat, one weakness, one one geese, making it possible for someone to force him to break the other geese. And that is the core, and that is the Tuatha de Danon in general. This has been an overview video. I'm sure I can do a more specific video at some point in the future. But, that is the Tuaha. Next week, I'm going to do, instead of a Tales from the Archive, I'm going to do an archival GMing, talking about the 
evolution of character sheets in gaming. And then following that, I'm going to do a another three-part series of locations in Legend of the Five Rings. I'm going to start with the second city, and then I will put a poll up on YouTube, um, on Twitter, to look at the other two locations with the top two getting getting coverage. So until next week, I'd like you all to remember to have fun and keep gaming.